This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. So look, you just clicked on a video all about Nazis and World War II, and it's probably not going to come as a shock to you that there are loads of documentaries about World War II on CuriosityStream, and plenty about the Nazis, of course, from Hitler's miracle weapons to the spies of war. Loads of great stuff. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms, web app, Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, the list just goes on. It's also available worldwide. You can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for you guys, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the promo code brainfood during the sign up process. It's a great way to support the show and keep us making more videos. And I think it's a really perfect fit for this channel. So let's get into it. When the Nazis steamrolled into the Netherlands in May of 1940, Janetje Johanna Hanni Schaft and Truus and Freddy Overstegen were just 19, 16, and 14 years old, respectively. As for the Overstegen sisters, their mother, Trien, had left their father years before. Freddy states of this, She was just fed up one day. We lived on a large ship in Harlem, but my father never made any money and didn't pay anything for the barge. But it wasn't an ugly divorce or anything. He sang a French farewell song from the bow of the ship when we left. He loved us, but I didn't see him that often anymore after that. Immediately after the Nazis came to town, despite the risks, Freddy goes on, During the war, we had a Jewish couple living with us, which is why my sister and I knew a lot about what was going on. At the same time, their mother also had her daughters join in with her in the rather dangerous task of posting and distributing anti-Nazi and communist literature around town. Given their brazen activities, word soon got around to the resistance that the girls might be open to joining, with one friend's van der Weel coming calling in 1941, Freddy states, A man wearing a hat came to the door and asked my mother if he could ask us to join the resistance. And he did. She was okay with it. She also states her mother simply requested of them that no matter what the resistance asked them to do, to always stay human. Of the sister's personal decision to join, Truss stated, A war like this is a very raw experience. When I was biking, I saw Germans picking up innocent people from the streets, putting them against a wall and shooting them. I was forced to watch, which aroused such an enormous anger in me, such a disgust. You can have any political conviction or be totally against war, but at that moment, you are just a human being being confronted with something very cruel. Shooting innocent people is murder. If you experience something like this, you'll find it justified that when people commit treason, such as exchanging a four-year-old Jewish girl for 35 guilders, you act against it. Needless to say, they were all for it, though not quite realizing at that point everything they'd be asked to do. She states, I thought we would be starting a kind of secret army. The man that came to our door said that we would get military training, and they did teach us a thing or two. Someone taught us to shoot, and we learned to march in the woods. There were about seven of us then, Hanny wasn't part of the group yet, and we were the only girls. Indeed, in the beginning, because of their age and gender, the authorities paid little attention to them. Thus, they were natural message runners between resistance members, as well as ideally suited for smuggling and stealing identity papers to help various Jewish people escape. They also occasionally were tasked with transporting weapons and even helping escort Jews to hiding places, generally Jewish children, as they blended in with the girls well, and the authorities on the whole weren't suspicious of the young girls walking along with kids. Also, thanks to Freddy's ultra youthful look, particularly when she did up her hair in pigtails, she was often used for reconnaissance missions, as nobody paid any attention to her. Things escalated from these sorts of tasks, however, with assignments such as helping to burn down various enemy installations. In these cases, the girls were sometimes tasked with flirting with any guards, while other resistance members slipped in and set the fires. In 1943, the sisters were joined by a third female member of their resistance cell, Henny Shaft, a woman who would go on to be one of the most famous Dutch resistance members in all of World War II, with her activities seeing her marked for death by Hitler himself. When the Nazis invaded, the then 19-year-old Hanny was studying international law and particularly human rights law at the University of Amsterdam. Unfortunately for her, she would soon be given the boot from university, owing to refusing to sign a Declaration of Allegiance to Germany, a requirement to remain a student, and something over three quarters of the rest of the students did. As you might imagine, even if you knew nothing else about her but her choosing to study human rights law at school and given the activities the Axis were getting up to in the country, she almost 
immediately join the resistance. In the interim, since the start of the war and being assigned to the same resistance cell as Truce and Freddy, Hanny worked with the resistance in various capacities and on countless missions, even learning German to aid in her activities. Naturally, the three girls became fast friends and frequently teamed up for the remainder of the war, with their missions having been expanded to something few women in the resistance were tasked with, directly eliminating enemy targets. Their big advantage over their male compatriots was their age and gender, which allowed them to get close to enemy soldiers without garnering any suspicion. Thus, the girls were eventually trained with weapons and set to, as Freddy put it, liquidating the enemy. As for the number of people they killed, a question they were frequently asked, they never disclosed, with the sister's stock answer to that question being, you never ask a soldier how many people he's killed. Perhaps the most famous method was flirting and convincing a mark to join one of them for a stroll. For example, in one instance, their target was an SS soldier who they scouted, and once he entered a restaurant to eat, a slightly drunk-acting truce entered and struck up a conversation. At a certain point, she then suggestively asked if he'd like to go for a walk in the woods with her, a prospect he apparently eagerly accepted. Then they ran into someone, which was made to seem a coincidence, but he was one of ours, and that friend said to Truce, Girl, you know you're not supposed to be here. They apologized, turned around, and walked away. And then shots were fired, so the man never knew what hit him. They had already dug the hole, but we weren't allowed to be there for that part. Beyond luring unsuspecting enemy soldiers and Dutch collaborators to their deaths, sometimes they just killed them outright. As Tris once stated, after watching horrified as a Dutch SS soldier grabbed a baby from the child's family and hit it against the wall, the father and sister had to watch. They were obviously hysterical. The child was dead. I pulled out a gun and shot him dead, right there and then. This wasn't an assignment, but I don't regret it. Other times, they would simply ride along on their bike, Truss on the front and Freddy on the back with a hidden gun. As they passed their mark, if no one was around, Freddy would pull out the gun and shoot him. After this, Truss would pedal off as fast as she could. Once out of sight, they were once again to all the world just a couple of young girls out for a bike ride. Other times, they'd just follow the mark home and then come a knocking, again with their young, innocent look, helping to ensure their target's guard would be down when they'd kill them. Beyond this, the trio also took part in bombings and other sabotage efforts, reportedly only refusing one mission in which they were asked to kidnap the three children of Reich Commissioner and former Chancellor of Austria, Arthur Seyss Inquart. The children were then to be used to get the Commissioner to release certain prisoners in exchange for their safe return. If he refused, the children would be killed. Said Truss of their refusal to do this mission, resistance fighters do not kill children. As for Hanny, while the two young girls often went overlooked, she was not so lucky. Her bright red hair and the many missions she took part in made her stand out. The authorities soon caught on and she was initially marked as the girl with the red hair. As the heat turned up on her and Hitler himself ordered efforts towards her capture ramped up, she began dyeing her hair black and changed her name. Unfortunately, her real name was accidentally revealed to an undercover Nazi operative working as a nurse. What followed from this was her family being detained, though eventually, when it became clear they didn't know where she was or anything about her activities, they were let go. The Axis got her in the end, however, when she was picked up at a random military checkpoint on March 21, 1945, having been caught with copies of the communist newspaper Wahid. She was subsequently tortured for a few weeks, but apparently never broke. Given the war was in its final stages, she may have survived if not for her bright red hair giving her away as it grew and with no dye to keep the roots black. Once the Germans figured out who she was because of this, the then 24-year-old Hanny was slated to be immediately executed, a sentence that was carried out on the 17th of April 1945, a mere 18 days before the Germans withdrew from the Netherlands. Apparently defiant to the ends, it is reported that when the two soldiers tasked with killing her shot her, she fell, but both had missed their mark for a killing shot. Her last words were reported to be mocking the soldiers, allegedly stating after the first volley, Idiots, I shoot better. As for the sisters, they survived the war but suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, with Triss burying herself in art and Freddy stating she got quickly married and started a family as her way to cope. Her son, Remy, would state of this, She shot people, but she hated it, and she hated herself for doing it. Freddy would also state, I've shot them myself, and I've seen them fall. And what is inside us at such a moment? You want to help them get up. Triss added, It was tragic and very difficult, and we cried about it afterwards. We did not feel it suited us. I wasn't born to kill. Do you know what that does to your soul? One loses everything. It poisons the beautiful things in life. 
In the end, both sisters lived to the ripe old age of 92, with Triss dying in June 2016 and Freddie following her in September 2018, the day before her 93rd birthday. If you'd like to read a lot more about this trio of badass ladies, you can find more in a friend of the Overstegen sisters, Sophie Polderman's recent book, Seducing and Killing Nazis, Hanny, Truss, and Freddie, Dutch Resistance Heroines of World War II. And I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, CuriosityStream, who I'm linking to below. And thank you for watching.